Amen. If you would, please take your Bible and open up to Revelation chapter 19. Revelation chapter 19. We continue our study. <clears throat> Much of Revelation through the uh, first 18 chapters was dark and gloomy for the church. We, we saw a lot of persecution. We saw a lot of death. We saw war, defeat, uh, 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 time and time again. And during that defeat, though, we would see glimmers of hope. We would see times where we realized that as a church, as the church of God, we would not be completely defeated. That, that in the end, we would be victorious. Uh, that all changed when we came to chapter 19. We saw a great picture develop of Jesus Christ and who He was for the church. We no longer saw the gloom and despair of persecution. We no longer saw the gloom and despair of defeat. But we saw a threefold image of the One in whom we worship and serve. We began to see Jesus united with His bride in verses 6-10 through 10 of chapter 19. We began to see Jesus as the conquering King in verses 11-21. through 21. And, and, and as we're going to continue to look at tonight. And then we also will come to find Jesus as the righteous judge in chapter 20. Within our text last week, we began to see this great unfolding of, of, in heaven of Jesus as a coming as a conquering king to bring final war against the beast, the false prophet, and those who have waged war against Jesus and the, His bride. It says, And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true and righteous. He does judge and make war. Within our text this week, we see this not so climactic war take place. For in the end, this final war, Armageddon, is not much of a war at all. If you would, Revelation chapter 19 and verses 17 through 21, if you're there, say amen. amen. I'll open up with 17 and 18 and we'll pray and get started. It says, And I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the fowls, that fly in the midst of heaven, come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God, that you may eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of captains and the flesh of mighty men and the flesh of horses and them that sat on them and the flesh of all men, both free and bond, both small and great. Let's pray. <coughs> Father God, we come before you tonight, Lord, and we seek you. We seek your truth, Lord. God, may we realize tonight whose side we stand on. For Father God, each and every one of us stand on a side in this war tonight. We will either stand on the side of victory through Jesus Christ, or we will stand on the side of defeat through, the, through this world. Father, there's only one thing that separates the lost from the saved, and that is the blood of Jesus. And so, Father, we pray that it be not I that speak tonight, Lord, but you that speak through me. Remind us, Lord, that judgment is coming. Remind us, Lord, that there is one way to victory, and that is the man, Christ Jesus. Once again, not I that speak, but you that speak through me. Amen. Amen. We begin in verses 17 and 18, the Supper of Wrath. The Supper of Wrath. There's two great suppers that have been mentioned in the book of Revelation. We've been going verse by verse through this study in the book of Revelation. That first being the wedding supper of the Lamb. The wedding supper of the Lamb. In verse 9 it says in chapter 19 and verse 9, And he saith unto me, Right, Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said unto me, These are the true sayings of God. The first supper that we find is a great supper. It's a supper of, uh, to, it's by invitation only by the blood of Christ. It is for those who are redeemed, those who have embraced, accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Those who have responded to the call of God in their life. It is a supper of great bliss and joy. It's a time of celebration, a time of victory. But then we also find within our text the supper of the great God. The supper within our text tonight, which is completely opposite of that of the Lamb. It will not be a time of bliss, and it will not be a time of joy. 
In fact, at the end of verse 17, it says, uh, I believe it, verse 17 at the end, it says, Come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God. If you look within the text of 17, that is an angel standing in the midst of the sun, calling all the birds and the fowl of the air, saying, Come, it's dinner time. Come, it's supper time. This supper will be not like the wedding supper of the Lamb, and this supper will be all inclusive. And what I mean by that, it may not, it's not the redeemed that are at this supper, but it's those who have made war against the, Jesus Christ and his bride. It's those that have lost the, found and, and followed the deception of this world. It's those who have rejected Jesus Christ. It says from the rich to the poor, those of influence and non-influence, those free and imprisoned, strong and in weak. See, we need to realize when God looks at you, He does not look at your status. He does not look at your influence. He does not look at how much money is in your checking account or what your last name is. He looks at one thing, and that is whether the blood of Christ covers your soul or not. And at the end of the day, that's what matters. That's what matters. We need to realize not only will the supper be all inclusive, this supper will be a supper of victory for Christ and the redeemed. We live in a world that hates Jesus Christ. We live in a world that hates the name of Jesus Christ. You can mention the name of God. You can mention His name. A lot of people do with an explicit at the end of it. You can say, well, you believe it. But when you begin to mention the name of Jesus, things start turning south real quick. Are you an extremist? You, 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 wanted, them event, you, you wanted them Bible thumpers. If you want to call me a Bible thumper, praise God, I'll take the title. I'll call it even and be done with it. There is no other name both under heaven and given among men on this earth and in Acts 4 and 12, and I messed that all up, but there is no other name under heaven given among men while we must be saved. It's Jesus. And the world does not like the name Jesus. The world doesn't like Jesus. It rejects Jesus. It rejects the things of the Word of God. And they act like and they live as if they're victorious. But in the end, it's going to be Jesus Christ and His redeemed that reign supreme. This supper will be a supper of wrath for those who have rejected and waged war against Christ and His bride. In Jeremiah 46 and 10, it says, For this is the day of the Lord God of hosts, a day of vengeance, that he may avenge him of his adversaries, and the sword shall devour, and it shall be uh, uh, statuated and, and made drunk with their blood. For the Lord God of hosts has a sacrifice in the north country by the river Euphrates, a day of wrath and judgment. I, I wonder tonight which supper you will be a part of. Will you be part of the wedding supper of the Lamb through the blood of Jesus Christ? Or will you be part of that great wrathful supper of God for those who have rejected Him? Where do you stand tonight? May we understand that the supper of wrath will be unavoidable. Unavoidable outside the blood of Jesus. We find not only as we've, we've seen one catastrophe after another globally throughout our text and our study of Revelation, whether it was the waters being destroyed through poison, whether it was the stars falling, whether it was population being destroyed, whether it was that great, that great city Babylon being destroyed, we finally find one more account of a, a global catastrophe at this supper of wrath. Because truly this is the wine press of God's judgment. We find at God's wine press of judgment, we find that river of blood that flows. Revelation 14, 20, and the blood, and the, and the wine press was trodden without the city, and blood came out of the wine press, even of the horse's bridle by the space of a thousand and six hundred furlongs. At God's wine press of judgment, we find the gathering of the kings, that you made the flesh of the kings. Revelation 16, we find that these, these kings come in to fight Jesus. It says, and he gathered them together in a place called in the Hebrew tongue, Armageddon. And at God's wine press of judgment, we find a final battle. A final battle, Armageddon. 
when we think of Armageddon, we think of something that is, that, that is climatic. Something that's going to shake. In Revelation, 6, in Revelation 19, we find that as we go on, that it's really not as climatic as people make it. In Revelation 19, 19 and 19, in verse 19, it says, I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered at the gate to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army, that final war. Armageddon, in the end, there's two camps at this battle. At the end of days, when you and I stand before God, when everybody stands before God, at the end of the day, when this battle takes place, there's only two sides. You don't get, you don't get a chance to stand in the middle. You don't get a chance to straddle the fence and say, well, I'm just going to sit on the sideline and wait to see who starts winning. This isn't a ball game where you can be a fair weather fan. You either choose now or you, cho you choose either to stand on the side of Christ or against Christ. Two camps at the end of the battle. They are gathered together to make war. You will find those who have rejected Christ led into war by the Antichrist and the false prophet. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies. And then the heavenly army led into war by Jesus Christ against him that sat on the horse and against his army. I wonder tonight, whose side will you be on? Whose side will you be on? Because at the end of the days, there truly is only two sides. Those that have accepted Christ or those that have rejected Christ. And there's no in-between. We need to realize that truth. In fact, at the end of the day, we find in Matthew 25, verses 32 through 34 and verse 41, the following. And before him shall be gathered all nations. And he shall separate them one from another as a shepherd divide his sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but on the goats on his left hand. In verse 34, then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. And those on his right, I mean, those on his right hand, he'll say that, but those on his left hand, he will say, Depart from me, ye cursed into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. And the only dividing factor, the only deciding factor, who will be truly on the standing on the right side or the left side that day will be the blood of Jesus Christ. Whether you've accepted Jesus or whether you've rejected Jesus. And see, so we have those in the church today that want to just go on about good works. Well, I, 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 I worked this at the church. I served as a deacon. I did a Sunday school teacher. I put money in the offering plate. I gave to that, I gave to that golden mission offering. I made sure I was there every time the doors were open. I prayed three and four times a day. I read my Bible. I did this and I've done that. I was rich. I was poor. I have all, it does not matter at the end of the day. What matters at the end of the day is whether you either accepted Jesus or rejected Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Because at the end of the day, that's it. And at the end of the day, God knows who are His and who are not His. And too many people in the church today and society today are playing Russian roulette with their soul. They're just trying to hold on and make sure the trigger doesn't get pulled before it's too late. We don't know what tomorrow holds. At my last church... We were out on the, we, I literally, our driveway opened up on Highway 1 South in Marianne, Arkansas. For those that don't understand Highway 1 South, it is a busy street. It is a highway. When all they were doing all the construction on 40, it was the main thoroughfare to go through. There were times that people would leave church, and several times people would pull out of the drive of the church and being a car wreck just like that. Because nobody could tell what was going on. Somebody wasn't paying attention. You could go home the night and have a heart attack and not come back from it. We don't, we're not guaranteed tomorrow. We're not guaranteed the next day. And at the end of the day, when you're judged, 
It won't be based on how much money you have in the checking account or what you've done, good, bad, or ugly. It's going to be determined on whether you accepted or rejected Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And He knows your heart. See, we can play the game with the preacher. We can tell the preacher, oh, I'm saved. We can walk the aisle. We can do the song and dance. We can act like everything's fine. I am a human. You can lie to me all day long. I've been lied to more than once. You won't be the first and you won't be the last. But at the end of the day, you cannot lie to God. That's right. He is a discerner of the hearts and minds and intent of the heart. And he knows who are his and who are not his. So which side will you stand on that great day of judgment? Because we need to realize judgment will be faced. In verse 20 of chapter 19, it says, And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast into a lake of fire, burning with, br burning with brimstone. We need to realize all will be held accountable, and it's going to begin with the leaders. I remember as I was preparing for this and studying for this, I was reminded of Genesis in chapter 3, when you find, in chapters 2, when you find the fall in the garden. And as you're discussing through the fall of the garden, it first comes to Adam and he says, well, that, or goes to Eve and says, what have you done? And she said, well, or the, Adam, and he goes, the woman you gave me did this. And so God goes to the woman and says, what if it, well, the serpent, he beguiled me. And then he goes to the serpent. And the serpent hasn't got nobody else to look at. He realizes, hey, God, he ain't got nobody to blame. And God judges him. And I'm almost certain that Adam and Eve were about like they're saying, that's right, God, you get him good. And then God gets done judging the serpent. And he goes back to Eve. And he begins to judge Eve. And when he gets done with the judgment on Eve, he turns around and he goes to Adam. And brings judgment on Adam. See, we need to realize we're all going to find judgment. And we're all going to be held accountable for our own actions. Our own acceptation and rejection of Jesus Christ. We find here in the scriptures that God begins to judge the leadership first. The beast was taken with him, the false prophet. Remember what they have done. They had deceived the world through satanic signs. They had driven the world through, to a blatant hatred toward God. And they had drove the world into idol worship. But that was no excuse for the people to follow. See, we have this idea we want to pinpoint and we want to blame others for our exception or rejection of Jesus Christ. We want to blame others. Why don't I go to church? Because they have a bunch of hypocrites down there at their church. They, they just, they're hypocrites. You go to Walmart, don't you? Don't keep them from going to Walmart. If you can go to Walmart with the hypocrites, or the shopping mall with the hypocrites, or the theater with the hypocrites, or the football games, or the camping trips with the hypocrites, surely you can come to church with the hypocrites. We have this idea, well, that preacher down there messed up. That preacher let me down. That preacher isn't going to determine whether you go to heaven or hell. You are. Well, this person, no, no. When you stand before God, there is no excuse. And you can say, well, that preacher or that church member or that supposed Christian, you can come up at the end of the day all you want. You need to understand as a pastor, if I've not failed you yet, hold on, it will happen at some point or the other. And be honest with you, it may happen multiple times. Y'all pray for me, I'm human. Some of y'all had that look on your face like, really? We didn't know that. I know, right? We're going to fail each other. <laughs> But don't let the failure of one man determine your eternity. Because at the end of the day, 
You're responsible for your decision whether to accept or reject Christ. You're responsible for your decision on whether you're obedient to the call of God on your life. You're responsible for whether you accept Him, reject Him, follow Him, obey Him, believe His Word, study His Word, pray the whole nine yards. At the end of the day, yes, those who have deceived you will be judged. But so will you. All will be held accountable, not just the leaders, but those that followed. You're held account accountable for your own actions and without excuse. Because at the end of the day, we will all face the judgment from the King of Kings. Saved and unsaved. In fact, we find that the Bible tells us that judgment begins at the house of God. Judgment from the king of kings in verse 21. And the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which sword proceeded out of his mouth, and all the fowls of, were filled with their flesh. Jesus will bring judgment on the total loss of this world. Not one person will escape. And the remnant were slain. Think about this, people. As we've been going through the study in the book of Revelation, a third of the two thirds of the sea has been destroyed. Stars have been destroyed. A third of the population has been destroyed. Plus many more. And finally, at the end of the day, none will survive. Not one. Doesn't matter about your bunker. Doesn't matter about your name or your influence. What matters is Jesus. And the remnant were slain, and all the fowls were filled with their flesh. All those that have shook their finger at God and said, I reject you. All those that have shook their finger at God and said, I know more than you. All those that have shook their finger at God and said, I'm God. I don't need you. In the end, to put it bluntly, become bird feet. The fowls of the air filled with their flesh. Jesus will bring judgment through his power and authority with the sword of him that sat upon the horse. And Jesus will bring judgment through his word, which the sword that proceeded out of his mouth. At the end of the day, you're not judged by Brother Charles. At the end of the day, you're not judged by your spouse or your children. At the end of the day, you're not judged by your church members or the loaf that are set beside you in the pew. At the end of the day, the one that judges you is Jesus Christ. He's the King of Kings. He's the righteous judge. And so at the end of days, which side will you stand? Will you stand on the side of Jesus in victory through his blood? Or will you stand and defeat the rejection of that same shed blood? Do you know the Lord? Know this, Jesus is the victor. He was the victor at creation, at the cross, and will be the victor at the day of judgment. And on that final day, this world and all that oppose Jesus will find themselves weighed and wanting. Will you find yourself with them? Will you find yourself in defeat without hope? Or will you find yourself covered in the blood of Jesus as only a witness to his judgment rather than an object of his judgment?